Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our How to Properly Select LEDs for your, your TPAD webinar. My name is Ryan Wood, Content Marketing Manager here at Epic. Before we get started, I just want to let you all know that you'll be muted during the presentation. If you do have any questions as we move along, please enter them in the questions panel located in the webinar control panel, and we'll try to get to them all at the end of the presentation. Uh, if we don't have time to go through all your questions, we'll be sure to reply back to you by email. Also, we will be recording this webinar and we'll post both the recording and the slide deck on our website and YouTube channel. Our presenter today is Stephen Goodman, our user interface and cable assembly product manager. Stephen is a mechanical engineer with a Bachelor of Science and MBA, both from Northeastern. Before joining Epic in 2017, Stephen ran a manufacturer's representative firm servicing various companies in the aerospace, defense, and industrial markets, helping them develop new products. As the user interface and cable assembly product manager here at Epic, Stephen works closely with customers to provide solutions to specific problems during design consultation and where needed, helping with the creation of specific designs. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Stephen. Thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stephen Goodman. So this afternoon, we'll be presenting our how to properly select LEDs for your keypad webinar. So before we jump in, it's important to note that LEDs are inexpensive. They come in a plethora of sizes and shapes. But if an LED change is necessary and it impacts your circuit, or even worse, your supplied electrical power, this can really wreak havoc on your program, your budget, and even your timeline. So our agenda today, we're going to have a quick overview of membrane switches and keypad technologies. We're going to review LED options for these keypads. We'll touch on some design options to reduce risk in these keypads. We have a uh, avionics bezel case study we'll present to you. And lastly, go through what we need to do to get started with your custom build. So first, a brief overview of membrane switches and keypad technologies. A membrane switch is defined as a momentary switch device in which at least one contact is on made of a, or a flexible substrate, and that's per ASTM. Generally speaking, these devices consist of dome switches, discrete LEDs, and some form of laminated uh, insulating materials and adhesive. Other keypad options are primarily made of silicone elastomer. These products are compression molded in a very common process and typically yield a durometer between 40 and 60 shore A. These types of keypads can be then paired with either a dome switch or even a conductive carbon pill depending on what the design requirements are. Generally speaking, these devices are a high reliability, low cost, and they're used everywhere. Within most of these designs, LEDs are the primary source for backlighting. And to facilitate that, there's a number of design options that can be used. So here's a, a cross section of a pretty standard membrane switch. Uh, this one here assumes a graphical overlay as the outermost layer shown here is layer number one on the top of the screen. For elastomeric keypad technologies, that overlay is replaced with a silicone rubber keypad, and similarly, adhesive is used to laminate to the parent structure. It's critical to note that the LED placement is pretty similar between both of these designs. The LED must be affixed mechanically and electrically to the parent circuit for this device to function properly. So for these LEDs to function, they need to be attached to this circuit. And there's a, several different types of circuit designs and technologies that we use. One of the first and most common, also the least expensive, is a PET or polyester circuit. These are wildly common. They're known for their greenish blue 
semi-transparent insulating materials as shown in the lower right-hand portion of our screen here. These are typically ultra-thin layers, typically seven thousandths of an inch is one of the, the thinnest layers we can achieve, but depending on the stack up, will typically be less than a millimeter or two in overall thickness. A rigid PCB, essentially a laminated F, FR4 type of circuit, is another common uh, circuit material for these keypad technologies. These are especially uh, valuable for designers if surface mounted components like LEDs or even ICs, resistors and so forth are needed. Generally speaking, the overall thickness is, is larger than that of the polyester type. They're more rigid uh, and they range from anywhere from an 063 standard FR4 thickness to something in, in the order of a quarter inch overall thickness. The last and can be most expensive design option for these types of keypads is an FPC uh, flexible printed circuit which is typically made of a polyimid base circuit. These are known for their amber or yellow brown translucent material of the circuit. Uh, these types of designs are formed with etched copper, whereas uh, the polyester design is a silk screened conductive uh, ink type material. The FPC circuits are uh, wildly appropriate for ZIF tails, especially if you have a half a millimeter uh, pitch for a ZIF tail. And again, the overall thickness is comparable to that of a PET polyester circuit. But all this is important, namely because the type of circuit that's chosen will drive the LED selection, and we'll expand upon that here. So we'll talk now about, about some LED options for your keypad. So according to Wikipedia, an LED is defined as a light emitting diode, which is a semiconductor light source that emits uh, light when a known current is flowing through it. The applications are endless for LEDs, whether it's a front panel for your smart HMI or your keypad, whether it's the headlights of your automobile, or even the interior lighting in your home or office, LEDs are everywhere in our lives. Additionally, LEDs are wildly common on surface mounted electronics, circuit board assemblies, and so forth. But generally speaking, these are low voltage devices. Most of them will operate and function at five volts DC or less. It's also important to note that the LED is a diode. It acts as a diode and behaves as one, which means current will only flow in one direction. Polarity matters in noting the anode and cathode of your device is important, making sure that information is available to the assemblers, to the designers, and so forth. Another notable uh, concern with LEDs is that without a current limiting resistor, they're at risk of burning up and damaging. So a current limiting resistor must be placed somewhere in your circuit in series with your LED design. Some specific types of LEDs to consider, starting with among the most common are, L are leaded LEDs. These are also known as through-hole LEDs, and they're known for having the wire-like posts extending from the bottom of the device. Typically, these include the actual LED, the diode itself, with some kind of lens, and the leads coming off of it. These are most common for rigid circuit board designs because it eliminates the need for an additional lens and assembly step. SMD, or surface-mounted LEDs, are among the most popular for these low-profile keypad technologies like membrane switches, keypads, and so forth. There's no wiring or anything that's needed to attach these to your circuit. Uh, they'll typically be soldered direct to a solder pad or some other uh, available space on your circuit board design. But these types of devices are wildly common and available 
in a number of sizes, colors, and package forms. The last type of LED worth discussing for today are what are called side-firing LEDs or some kind of right-angle LED. These are unique because instead of emitting upwards, outwards towards the user, they actually will be emitting light 90 degrees to the, to the normal direction of these out, well, outward facing LEDs. Side firing LEDs are ideal for light guide film, which is another unique technology we'll expand upon. The biggest challenge with side firing LEDs is there is somewhat of a limited availability of sizes and colors. So this is important if you run into an obsolescence issue or some kind of design change because you may not be able to find the right color, package form, or performance in a side firing LED if it goes obsolete. A bit more about our light guide film technology. The side firing LED is placed outside of the viewing area. This is not a device or die that is visible to the user. It's typically hidden behind an overlay or somewhere else in the design that you can't see. Instead, that light will radiate horizontally through the light guide film and then reflect outwards to the user in a very specific and strategically controlled pattern. Light guide film design options are ideal for uniform brightness to reduce hot spots, and especially if selective backlighting is required. A bit more about selective backlighting, that means to individually light each key. Instead of having one backlight common and illuminating all 12 buttons, for example, a selectively backlit keypad will be able to backlight each individual key separately upon command. The biggest challenge with these types of instances is you need more real estate on the circuit board to be able to put the appropriate light block measures and place the LEDs outside the viewing location. Because of this, not all selectively backlit designs are manufacturable. So a bit more about the LED sizes and colors. If anyone spent time looking at the online distributors such as Mauser or DigiKey, you know there's a lot of options to choose from, whether it's a manufacturer, the package size, the electrical performance, or even some characteristic of the light itself, such as brightness or chromaticity. It can be overwhelming on where to start. For some designs, there may be a half a dozen or so different LEDs that will do the job, and then it ends up inevitably picking either the least expensive or the one that has the most stock available. The other important item to note when considering an LED size or color, it's important to note the high level requirements for a non-critical application. And what we mean by that is if you, if you or your customer only needs a red or a blue LED, and there's not a lot of requirements outside of that. It's recommended to not design oneself into a corner and specify a very specific part number or brand of LED. And because of this, we always recommend where possible to add verbiage to your drawing, permitting the use of a, an equivalent LED or an alternate LED for the application. Another important note is to clearly delineate the difference between a must-have and a nice-to-have requirement. Scope creep is common for rapidly evolving development projects, so it's especially critical for designers, engineers, and all stakeholders to clearly define what is a requirement versus something that without an impact to cost or schedule would be a nice to have. And for anybody that's been through a rapidly evolving development project, changes are inevitable. 
Because of this, we strongly recommend to build samples, build them quickly, and then assess the performance. Additionally, especially in today's landscape with supply chain, individual LED part numbers have high obsolescence risk or minimum order quantities, both of which can be a barrier to change LEDs or to recover from a shortage. Some other keypad backlighting options to consider that also use LEDs would be fiber optic backlighting or light pipes. And again, LEDs are the primary light source for these types of solutions, and each has their own unique role in bringing products to market. Next, we'll be touching on some design options to reduce risk in your custom membrane switch or keypad assembly. So first, it's, it's important to note that not all membrane switches use automated equipment to populate. Some of these devices actually use hand-placed individual LEDs, dome switches, and so forth. Because of this, if an ultra-small package size LED is specified, it can be cumbersome or even high risk to assemble. Because of this, an 0603 size is, is among the smallest we'd recommend. And obviously, there's a lot of variables that impact the size of the LED you're going to choose. But generally speaking, if a 0603 size or larger can be used, that's a pretty solid approach. Another high-risk LED uh, decision that should be considered is when and whether to use a yellow LED or an amber LED. Now, this is important because, uh, at least personally, I've had to deal with some yellow LEDs that have gone obsolete, and we've had challenges finding a drop-in replacement. One of the options we've considered in the past is presenting the use of an amber LED in its place. This can actually be beneficial because some of these are more easily seen and be brighter for the same or equivalent package size and power source. So because of this, we strongly recommend to dual source all LEDs, create a plan for an alternate, and really take a strategic proactive approach to risk mitigation. Another high-risk concern is the ESD threshold of your LED. Not all of these keypads include some type of shielding in them, whether it's a foil shield or some kind of static shield that uh, is placed atop the membrane switch stack up. If these ESD prone areas create failures in your assembly, it's going to drive a redesign, it's going to drive costs, and it's going to drive an impact to the overall timeline. Another thing to con consider when specifying LEDs is the use or the lack thereof of multicolored LEDs. Some of these, such as a bicolor or tricolor LED can have a higher risk of obsolescence. And although it may solve problems by having three different colors of an LED in one individual die, if that item becomes obsolete and you need to replace that tricolor LED with a discrete red, a discrete blue, and a discrete green LED, that may require a board respin. Another area of risk is brightness. So brightness is, although it's something that can be measured using certain instrumentation, it's ultimately something that's perceived by the user. Because of this, we strongly re recommend building, testing, 
doing whatever it takes to energize those LEDs and to assess their performance. There's nothing more frustrating to a designer than to build a device, energize it, only for the LEDs to either be too bright that you're blinding your customer, or they're too soft and you can't even see them and read the keypad text that's on there. So other, other variables will impact keypad brightness, one of which is what the material is that's immediately atop or above the LED. Some of these materials, while translucent, will attenuate the brightness or soften that. There's even steps that can be taken to add translucent paints or inks to further reduce or attenuate the brightness. Another concern is centered around the LED driver circuits themselves. So these types of ICs, like most semiconductors these days, have some inherent supply chain risk. So because of this and where possible, we recommend dual sourcing or developing some type of redundancy in your design if an LED driver IC is needed. <clears throat> so as we said, there's a couple options that exist if it's determined the brightness is not satisfactory. One option may be as simple as just swapping the LED to another one that has a similar package size and electrical performance. Another one is to actually drive it harder with more power, both of which could potentially create the need for a circuit respin. PWM, or pulse width modulation uh, brightness control, is commonly used to help adjust the brightness of LEDs real time to a specific value as discussed and agreed upon by all stakeholders. It's important to note that adding a PWM circuit local to an actual membrane switch or keypad can be risky. We suggest adding that capability external to the actual keypad, ideally to a daughter board or a parent PCBA somewhere else away from the immediate vicinity of the keypad. If that's not an option, these types of PWM circuits can be added to the rear side of membrane switches, assuming that the circuit type can support it. Next, we'll be talking a bit about our night vision imaging systems, or NVIS, compliant LEDs. MIL standard 3009 is a wildly known and common specification for this type of application. Of these, the most common are ENVIS Green A and Green B. Green A and Green B correspond to the chromaticity readings, basically the breakdown of the light itself into certain wavelengths and intensities. And if compliant to these, most night vision goggle systems will not be impacted by an illuminated LED because they're not in the amplification range that these types of goggles and headsets use. So typically these are high risk, they're known for their long lead times, they can be expensive. And because of this, there really are limited options. At Epic we have Several design solutions we have considered in the past that include using an off-the-shelf LED that's rated for an Envis Green A or Green B requirement, or where we'll have to take an ordinary uh, white LED and add some kind of filtering mechanism. Lastly, it's important to note that you can build, assemble, and energize these devices and yet still be non-compliant to the specification. Because of this, chromaticity testing, the actual measurement of the light that's emitted, may be required to satisfy your program objectives.
One final note here about LED risk is about the placement of the LED itself. The actual mounting locations and the techniques will vary by application, but are especially critical. Making sure that the LEDs or buttons themselves are not too close to an edge or too close to one another will help designs achieve a very challenging or unique selective backlighting requirement. If you or your customer needs selective backlighting, Epic recommends at least 15 millimeters between the buttons themselves as shown here in the upper right hand portion of our screen. This is to accommodate any light block that needs to be placed within the light guide film and it also allows us to strategically place the LEDs where they're not visible and can uniformly backlight the button. Some other tricks that we can use to achieve a unique design requirement would involve rear mounting the LED. And what we mean by this is actually placing the LED on the rear side of a circuit board, electrically and mechanically connecting it there and putting a small through hole in the board so that light can radiate outwards towards the user. The benefit here is it helps reduce the overall height of the stack up or it can be used to better backlight a dome switch type application as shown here on our screen. Ultimately, there's a lot of different mounting arrangements to consider, but a careful review of those nice to have and must have requirements will help down select what and how to make your design a reality. Next, we're going to go through our avionics bezel case study. So in this particular application, our customer came to Epic looking for a custom bezel to be used for a development activity. While this isn't the exact design, this is a concept that represents the end accomplished and functional device that Epic developed. The primary design challenge was that based on the footprint of the system we were assembling this bezel to, we had a max dimension of three quarters of an inch for the width of the bare circuit board, of which we needed to have all surface mounted components, dome switches, interface connectors and cables, as well as all active electronics to both control the brightness and regulate the voltage to drive all these LEDs. Additionally, our customer came to Epic with about a month and a half development timeline that they needed functional samples. So to develop this design, Epic worked with the customer to clearly delineate the nice to have versus the must have requirements. From this, Epic developed a proposed solution that utilized a four layer circuit board. It ended up being less than three quarters of an inch in overall width to fit within the machine bezel that we developed. The biggest challenge here is that with a four layered board, and the roughly two dozen LEDs that were needed to drive the design, Epic had limited options to wire all those. And what I mean is all of those LEDs needed to be in series for us to properly route and achieve this design with the limited space we have. So because voltage adds in series for these types of device devices, we needed a roughly 50 volts DC voltage to supply enough power to all LEDs in series. And for those who have worked on an aerospace project, most aircraft power comes in at 28 volts DC. 
So inevitably, the design challenge here is to co-locate the DC to DC converter circuitry locally on this board to be able to step up or step down the power to properly drive these LEDs. Additionally, Epic needed to develop a PWM circuit that was co-located on the rear of the circuit board to be able to develop, test, and meet the customer's ever-changing and a bit fluid design targets. Epic was able to participate and deliver on this project, and we're looking forward to the future of this activity here. Next, we'll talk about the steps that are needed to get started on any custom keypad or membrane switch project that utilizes LEDs. As we've said several times here, it's absolutely vital to develop a comprehensive list of all the must-have versus nice-to-have requirements. Specifically, there's a handful of considerations here, all of which should be discussed with the stakeholders at your organization and whatever manufacturer you end up deciding to partner with to bring this to market. The decisions about whether to backlight a button or to have an individual discrete LED in a small window adjacent to the button, that has drastic impacts on the overall design. The number of buttons that actually need to be illuminated is another concern. That may drive the number of LEDs needed in the circuit. The actual colors of the LEDs is also important. There's some tricks that can be done if, for example, only white LEDs are needed. The LED window immediately above the LED on the membrane switch can be actually translucently painted with a red or a blue hint of paint, giving the window an appearance of a red or blue LED when in fact the light source is white. Another consideration is to carefully agree upon pass-fail criteria for backlight uniformity. And what we mean by that is how critical are hotspots? What are we doing with this project? Is this going to be for a development purpose to be used in a lab? Or is this something to be used in somebody's home where a hotspot on the LED or a non-uniform brightness is going to be a significant impact to the aesthetics of the design. Understanding how large of a device we can use also drives the design, both the package size and the overall height. A lot of these decisions will then help a designer like Epic determine the appropriate mounting arrangements, whether it's a surface-mounted LED, whether it's leaded LED or through-hole LED is appropriate. It also helps us understand if alternates are allowed. If all you or your customer cares is that the LED is blue, we have lots of options. Whereas if this needs to be a night vision goggle compliant LED, there's far fewer options to choose from. Making sure the, the dimming of these LEDs is properly accounted for both on your circuit board or elsewhere in your design is absolutely critical. And again, making changes to the circuit or the LED footprint will impact cost and schedule. So having a non-dimmable LED and having changes made to the design making that a dimmable LED is a major design change. Another consideration is whether or not the LEDs should be in series with any switches. Depending on how the, the board is wired and the device should operate, some LEDs can be placed in series with a dome switch. Others can be controlled remotely with a microcontroller that's also controlled with the dome switch, but yet not in series with that actual circuitry. Light guide films, light pipes, and so forth, any kind of additional 
type of device used to get the light from the source to where the user needs to see it is another consideration that needs to be reviewed. And lastly, and I think most importantly, making sure it's clear who can approve the final design and what those pass-fail criteria are, are so valuable. But ultimately, for any project, the very first step to get a project going is to have a schematic and a dimensioned drawing to get it started. So a brief overview of the typical development timeline can range anywhere from four to 20 weeks, depending on how involved or complex the design is. So based on our rough estimates here, a standard keypad in which solely consists of some kind of flexible circuit, LEDs, and either a ZIF tail or some kind of connector, we consider those fairly standard and can go from an initial concept to getting parts in your hands in about four to six weeks. And obviously the more answers and information that we have about what you're trying to accomplish, the better we are and the more quickly we can react. For a complex keypad where maybe additional surface mounted components are needed or an IP rating is needed, that can definitely add some complexity, but overall it may add a couple weeks. It's not gonna double or triple the overall timeline necessarily. And then lastly, a smart HMI, and to us, that's something that includes a PWM circuit, some kind of voltage DC to DC converter, or some other unique microcontroller-based logic that may or may not require firmware. That's obviously more involved. Typical development timelines for those can be 8 to 20 weeks. And again, it depends on how much information is available, if any of these items have long lead, uh, lead times. Generally speaking though, as we've said, most projects here, we can create functional samples and get them to you or your customer in a little more than a month. So, next, we'll go over our summary and then get to our Q&A. So in summary, LEDs are wildly available, reliable, and inexpensive. There's lots of sizes and colors to choose from, package sizes, mounting techniques, and so forth. Some of these LEDs are high risk and susceptible to long lead times or high minimum order quantities. There's nothing more frustrating than only needing four or five LEDs and having to buy a whole reel. Situations like that, Epic may have options. We may be able to get samples of those uh, instead of trying to source a whole reel or whatnot. It's also important to note that a redesign will be expensive, whether it's the actual direct costs for your board designer or a company like Epic to actually facilitate the activity or the indirect costs associated with what it takes to get a design change pushed through and get new samples made. And lastly, and again, most importantly, we believe a clear delineation of the must-have versus nice-to-have requirements is absolutely necessary. So with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan to talk a bit about some of the other products that Epic offers. Thank you, Stephen. While we review the questions that came in, I just wanna briefly mention some of the additional product solutions that we offer here at Epic, such as custom battery packs, flex and rigid flex PCBs, printed circuit boards, RF products, user interfaces, flexible heaters, and our energy efficient fans and motors. Now we will pass it back over to Stephen to review the questions that came in. Okay, um, first one here I see, uh, is there a brand of LED or LED manufacturer 
you can recommend. Um, my opinion on this is, is no, we, we would actually prefer not to specify a specific LED manufacturer unless there's something especially unique about the LED. So unfortunately, I, I don't think it's best to recommend an LED manufacturer and put that on the drawing. We strongly suggest to leave it at the high level requirements, really just because of where we're at in the world today and the overarching supply chain crunch we're up against. Um, next question here. We are having issues sourcing an a NVIS compliant film. The, the supplier has completely ghosted us. We aren't sure how to proceed. What advice can Epic pass along? Um, yikes. Uh, I, I've heard stories about issues with uh, some NVIS suppliers, specifically one in Florida. Um, my my opinion is uh, it's probably best to try to find another vendor. Depending on what your issue is and you're trying to to address, um, you know there may be an option. Whether it's finding an off-the-shelf LED or trying to find an alternate film and pairing that with a, a white or other color LED, um, that's unfortunate. Uh, next next question here. Looking for guidance. Our double E specced in an LED that's barely able to be seen on our keypad that's used in direct sunlight. Um, this is actually something we, we talked about here earlier in the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that this, this question is based off of a yellow LED um, because we run into these a lot, and if that's the case, we'd strongly suggest an amber LED or to try and find a higher intensity LED. Uh, but, but ultimately, it sounds like a, a careful study needs to be done of how that LED is placed and what's above it that's potentially uh, uh, reducing the overall brightness. Uh, next question. My company has a board respin and we're considering moving the LED's current limiting resistor locally to the membrane switch. How much does this cost and how long do you think it will take? Um, uh, my answer to most of these is unfortunately it depends. Uh, but if, if it's only a change to the circuit, which is hopefully what the case is, that's a pretty quick change. Um, you know, it may just be, uh, you know, modifying the trace adding additional locations to, to locate a service mount resistor. Um, I think best case, this would be a, a few weeks type of an impact, and ideally less than $1,000 of NRE, but obviously every design's changed, or every design's different, so um, I think something like that would, would warrant more, more information to be able to better quantify a timeline and cost. Um, next question here is, my marketing department isn't thrilled with our backlighting and wants to illuminate each button, but we can't find a snap dome that can be used in our application. Um, well, again, not, not knowing enough about what the design consists of and what uh, this, this individual is trying to accomplish, um, if a dome switch is getting in the way of the LED and impacting the backlighting performance, there's definitely a couple things we could look at. One of which is is a uh, light guide film. Um, that definitely can add some complexity, but may not be a bad consideration. Another option that I think is pretty solid is actually to use a, uh, a silicone rubber keypad with a conductive carbon pill. Uh, that can be placed on the rear of the keypad and actually a uh, an LED can be placed adjacent to that pad location. And if uh, the silicone specified is translucent, um, I think that that could be, be a good solution to eliminate the need for a dome switch. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. I wanna thank everybody for attending and listening to our webinar. 
Thank you so much and have a great day.